it's a great joy, a wonderful joy to be able to welcome you, Bill Craig, William Lane Craig, for uh, Q&A on the lecture we just heard. Uh, you've been to Sweden several times, and now yes. uh, you are here through the internet, ready to answer our questions. And I had the privilege of studying under you, which was wonderful. And I'm still learning things from you. I just learned <laughs> things the last 24 minutes. So thank you so much for sharing what you've studied Certainly. about the, the atonement. Without further ado, I'll just uh, leave to you, Martin. Sure. All right, everyone. I can see uh, some questions are already trickling in. Uh, if you're ready, Dr. Craig, let's get started, huh? I am. Thank you. All right. Okay, let's go. Uh, first question comes from Jonathan. How can Jesus, as one man, take the punishment for all men? Shouldn't one life be equivalent for one life? Could Jesus have died in any other way? For example, if God let Jesus come into the world and then directly executed him. So a mm -hmm. couple of questions in that one, but... Right. Two questions there. And I think that the first question would be quite right uh, if Jesus were merely a human being, I don't think any mere human being could atone for the sins of mankind. And that's why the de deity of Jesus is critical. This was a divine person who had died according to his human nature, and therefore his death can be of infinite value to atone for sin because of the divinity of his person. Now, the second um, question. I think there certainly God could have allowed Jesus to be killed in some other way, perhaps executed by beheading, say, or some other manner. But here I would agree with people like Thomas Aquinas and Hugo Grotius that God's choice of the passion and crucifixion of Christ was well motivated because of the moral influence that that death would have upon mankind in drawing people to faith in Christ. I think that the passion of Christ has had a, just an incredible influence upon mankind, and that therefore the contingent choice of this manner of death was very wise on God's part. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, okay, second question comes from Anst. Why aren't fallen angels also reconciled at the cross? Yeah. Well, because Jesus did not die for the sins of fallen angels. Now, the question might be then asked, well, why not? Why not die to redeem them? And here we're just speculating, but I think a possible answer could be that they, having fallen away from God, are so incorrigible that nothing would suffice to bring them back to free uh, repentance and faith in God, that they are irredeemably evil, uh, and that therefore there was no point in having Christ die for the fallen angels. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from uh, Dr. Ray Baker, our colleague at Apologia. He says, if Christ took the punishment for the world's sin, why do sinners have to be punished in hell? Seems like the only alternatives are limited yeah. atonement or denying the retributive nature of hell. Oh, I think that there's another alternative, and that would be that God respects free will and that he therefore offers us a divine pardon for sin on the basis of Christ's atoning death, but that we are at liberty either to accept or to refuse that pardon. And if we refuse his pardon, then we fall back on his justice. And here I would appeal to the analogy of the way pardons function in our Western systems of justice. If a condemned criminal receives a, or offered a pardon and he refuses the pardon, um, it cannot be forced upon him, and he will then have to pay the just desert for his crime. And there have been cases in the law where condemned criminals have preferred to 
pay the penalty for their crimes rather than to accept a pardon from the executive power of the state. So I differ with our Calvinist brethren in thinking that the atonement of Christ is efficacious independent of our free will. I think that it potentially wins the salvation of all mankind, but that potential needs to be actualized by a free affirmative response to God's offer of a pardon. Can I just have a follow-up on that? Um, what, about, what about those who then end up in hell? Wouldn't you say that hell in a certain way becomes like a double punishment uh, because Christ has been punished for those sins somehow, in a sense, already, yeah. but there will, or wouldn't there be some kind of double punishment here? Or is well, that I wrong? do. Th there, there would be perhaps a sort of double punishment in that sense, and that Christ's suffering was adequate to atone for their sins. I think that what Jesus suffered is of infinite value, and so no matter how many people are born in the future in sin, it, it's enough to cover for them. But if a person refuses the pardon, then God has to give him what he deserves, um, because that's what justice is. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on, let's see, a question from Ula here. Thank you for your work. Was there anything in your findings that really baffled you? Well, I guess what baffled me was how I could have been unaware of so many of the insights that I gained through this study. I think the secondary literature on this subject is very poor. Uh, and so in each of the three areas I dealt with, biblical theology, uh, historical theology, and philosophy, there were new insights for me. In the biblical area, I was not aware of the radical difference between the two meanings of the word atonement, one being reconciliation and the other one being uh, cleansing or expiation of sin. And this was so important because it turns out that most contemporary theories of the atonement are not, in fact, theories of the atonement in the biblical sense of the word of, of expiation. Uh, they're really theories about reconciliation, and I think are therefore quite inadequate biblically. Historically, I was shocked to discover how seriously the church fathers have been misrepresented in the secondary literature as being all enamored with the ransom theory of the atonement and the Christus Victor model that uh, people like St. Anselm had been caricatured as treating God as though he were a feudal uh, monarch who was not magnanimous enough to forgive, and then penal substitutionary theories as well that failed to understand the deep analogies to penal substitution in our contemporary Western systems of justice. So in every area I touched on, uh, I was just baffled and surprised by these insights that I gained that I had not previously been aware of. Okay, this uh, here's a two-parted uh, question from Gabriel. If the punishment for sin is in proportion to the sin, can hell really be eternal? And if the punishment for sin is eternal separation from God, in other uh. words, hell, how come Jesus did not have to be separated from God eternally? Okay, let's take the second part first. Uh, again, I would say that you can make up for a lack of duration by increasing intensity. Someone who suffers from a hangnail, a painful hangnail, for eternity will suffer infinite pain but it will be prolonged. That could be all shrunk into the course of an hour or two, in which case the intensity would be equal, but the duration would be less. And I think that Jesus suffered in intensity what the damned in hell suffer over eternity. In fact, because the future is 
merely potentially infinite, not actually infinite, the damned in hell never actually suffer infinite punishment or infinite pain. At every point, it is still finite. And I think Jesus bore all of that in the intensity of his separation from God the Father. And I would say that the separate or the separation or rupture of fellowship with God is the punishment for sin. That is the just desert that we have, is to be separated from God, not to be related to him. And um, there are two ways in which one could think about the eternality of hell. One would be that God would let people out if they would repent and believe, but they refuse to. They're like those fallen angels. They're incorrigible. And so as uh, Jean-Paul Sartre said that the door to hell is locked from the inside, that would be one way of explaining it. The other way would be this. Insofar as the damned in hell continue to hate God and rebel against him, they continue to sin. And therefore, their punishment continues to increase uh, the longer they endure. So in that sense, every sin would receive only a finite amount of punishment, but because sin goes on forever, the punishment would go on forever as well. Hell would be literally self-perpetuating. So those would be two perspectives. Um, a third perspective would be simply to say that the sin of rejecting God is a sin of infinite gravity and proportion. Um, it is the greatest sin and therefore does deserve an infinite punishment. Great. Thank you. Um, question from Pad here. Presently, we have a challenge in Sweden, as in other uh, countries, that not only liberal Christians, but also members in evangelical churches say that we should no longer speak criti critically about sin, especially the one most embraced in Western culture, but instead affirm uh, and talk about God's love. How would you respond to such a claim? Well, I would ignore it. Uh, I think that we, as faithful Christians and disciples of Jesus, have to be faithful in proclaiming the full gospel. Now, I don't think that means we have to be in your face or rude or use Christian vocabulary. Very often, for example, instead of the old-fashioned word sin, I'll talk about moral wrongdoing. All of us have experience moral failures in our life where we have not lived up to our moral obligations. And anyone who's honest will recognize that. And therefore, the question of how one can be cleansed of one's moral failures, uh, how can one find forgiveness and pardon for one's moral wrongdoing is a very relevant question. Excellent. Thank you. Wow, we're uh, we're going at a pretty good pace here, Bill. That's uh, that's great. We're covering good. a lot of ground. Um, the yes. next question is not uh, about teaching on sin, but on teaching uh, about the atonement itself. So, when teaching yeah. and preaching penal substitution, how do we avoid popular misunderstandings such as cosmic child abuse or yeah. God sacrifices Himself to Himself to save mankind from Himself? Um, so oh, caricatures. Well, yeah, right. I think that what we have to do is to try to explain it as best we can um, and portray the incarnation and passion of Christ as an act of voluntary divine self-substitution and self-sacrifice. And as such, it is a noble act, a, 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 a praiseworthy act that God would stoop to bear our punishment and pain out of his love for us to redeem us from our own sin and, and perdition. And I think if we portray the incarnation and passion as a voluntary act of divine self-sacrifice, um, that then that that takes on 
the correct appearance of being a noble action on God's part. Now, the part I would disagree with would be where it says he saves us from himself. Uh, it's not God who is our enemy here. It's, it's ourselves that it is our just desert to be punished for our sin. And here, this might involve defending a retributive theory of justice, uh -huh. which fortunately, uh, during the last part of the 20th century, has once again become the mainstream view among legal theorists and philosophers of law. A retributive theory of justice says that punishment is justified because the guilty deserve it. The guilty deserve to be punished. And that's why the state is justified in administering harsh treatment to its citizens who commit crimes. And on a retributive theory of justice, it is we who have committed moral wrongdoing, and it is our just desert to be punished. And this redounds to God's righteousness and holiness and and uh, justice. Great. Thank you. Um, so um, it seems to me that that idea of retributive justice is maybe somewhat easier to defend in our time and our culture compared to the idea of substitution, which uh, the next question yeah. uh, concerns. Uh, we right. don't allow in our legal systems an innocent person to take the punishment that should rightly be inflicted, inflicted on a guilty person. So how can the idea of Jesus, who was innocent, taking the place of the guilty, be morally justified? Yeah. What this person would be surprised to learn is that the idea of imputation of liability and even guilt to an innocent or blameless third person is a common feature in Western systems of justice. It's called vicarious liability. In both civil law and even in criminal law, wrongdoing by one person can be imputed to another person who is then vicariously liable or guilty. And in my book on the atonement, I lay out quite a number of court cases uh, where there have been findings of vicarious liability or guilt. And it is based upon a principle uh, called respondeat superior, which means, roughly speak, translated, the master is answerable. And the idea here is that a superior can be held liable or guilty for crimes or wrongs committed by a subordinate. And in Western systems of justice, this principle is widely applied to cases involving employers and employees so that an employer who is blameless in the matter can be held vicariously liable for crimes and wrongs committed by the employee. And I think this provides a very striking analogy to the doctrine of the imputation of our sins to Christ, so that when Christ was punished for our sins, uh, God did not punish an innocent person. He punished a guilty person, namely Christ, who had been imputed the guilt of our sins. And so it's not a matter of punishing an innocent person. He was vicariously liable for our sins. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um... Okay, next question here from Mikael. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us, and thank you for your massive contribution to apologetics over the years. I know that I'm not alone here deeply appreciating your work. Uh, what, is your, uh, what is your response to the idea that there is a conflict between substitutionary atonement and the doctrine of eternal conscious torment? How is it that Christ took our punishment through his suffering and physical death on the cross? if the fate of the lost is to only suffer but never physically die. To describe eternal conscious torment as eternal death 
uh, does not seem to me to solve the problem as Jesus' death was physical, uh, a physical and literal oh. death. Well, I, I think that, in fact, Jesus did experience a rupture of his relationship with God. It wasn't just physical death. As horrible as crucifixion is, that physical suffering could not have atoned for the sins of humanity. I think that what Jesus suffered was um, alienation from God the Father, the, the one who had never known estrangement from God now experienced that alienation and estrangement for us and instead of us. Um, and as far as then how the punishment of the loss can go on forever, I would have referred to my previous answer where I gave several possible answers as to how uh, hell could be uh, either uh, locked from the inside, it could be self-perpetuating, or it could be that this is a sin that is of infinite gravity uh, and therefore merits uh, eternal punishment. Uh, a follow-up there. Uh, how would you describe the, the separation between the Father and the Son? Because after all, they are one. So how to make sense? Yeah. Well, they're one substance, but as you know, they're not one person. This is the relevance of the doctrine of the Trinity for the atonement. We are not dealing with a Unitarian concept of God, where God is a person. So the person of the Son and the person of the Father are two different persons, and I think that uh, when he bore the punishment for our sin, he experienced that rupture of a personal relationship with his father, with whom he had had eternal, blessed communion forever. And so, as uh, Francis Turretin, the Swiss theologian, says, uh, Christ being forsaken by God the Father involved the loss of full communion and fellowship with the Father, a loss of full felicity and divine blessedness uh, and alienation. Um, so that, that, is, that requires a Trinitarian concept of God to work. So, Thank you. Okay. Um, I've been hearing about nonviolent theories of the atonement. Mm. What is that all about and what do you think of it? It's all about the idea that God would be cruel to punish Jesus for our sins. And I don't think highly of this at all. Uh, the theologian Oliver Crisp has said, given the crucifixion of Jesus, how could there be any theory of the atonement that doesn't involve violence? Um, God chose the crucifixion as a means of our redemption. So no matter what theory of the atonement you have, Christus Victor, moral influence, governmental theory, satisfaction model, penal substitution, they all involve the horrible violence of the crucifixion. Um, so the question would be, well, which one can make the best sense of it? And I think the idea that Christ bore the punishment that we deserved so that we might be forgiven and freed makes good sense of the use of that um, means of redemption. Okay. Um, we have another question uh, on uh, these many models of, of the atonement. Yes. So how would you relate the model of penal substitution to the Christus Victor perspective or... Uh, uh -huh. the governmental or any of the other that you mentioned? Okay. I think that it is by penal substitution that God frees us from the bonds of hell and death and Satan. It is by Christ's paying the punishment for sin that we deserve that we can then be pardoned and redeemed and thereby delivered, which is the point of Christus Victor, is deliverance from Satan, death, and hell. Um, and here again, I want to recur to the idea of a pardon 
how can a condemned criminal be justly freed from prison? Well, the, the only way is by receiving a pardon. If he is pardoned by the state, then he can be released from prison and, and go free. And so what Christ's penal substitution secures for us is a divine pardon that redeems us. I think that penal substitution also lies at the heart of the moral influence theory, which is that Christ's passion kindles within us a love of God and a love of Christ when we see the extent and the depths of his suffering and the, the love that he exemplified for us. And it seems to me that their penal substitution is right at the heart of that moral influence. It's been rightly said that if someone were to drown while trying to save me from drowning, I would say greater love has no man than this that he would give up his life for me. But if someone were to just throw himself into the water, even though no one was drowning, and say, look how much I love you, and drown, it would be unintelligible. It would just be bizarre. So it is penal substitution that makes the moral influence theory make sense. So my atonement theory is multifaceted. I want to have an atonement theory that is like a beautiful jewel that has all of these different facets, Christus Victor, governmental model, moral influence, penal substitution, and together they build a multifaceted atonement theory. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Uh... Okay. Uh, do we have do we have time for uh, for one or two more? Sure. Okay. Great. I'm trying to see uh, some of, of the ones at the top here are quite similar um, to to some of the ones we've addressed. Um, how about mm. this one? Uh, there's been a lot of comparisons to our human justice system. What's the warrant for assuming that God's justice works the same in the same way as our Western justice systems? How do we know which uh, analogies hold and which don't? From the Bible, I, I would never build an atonement theory based on Western systems of justice. There are disanalogies, obviously. Rather, you begin with the Bible, and I think that the biblical concept of God's justice is largely retributive because God administers justice at the end of the world. His judgment and punishment at that point is too late to serve purposes of deterrence or moral reformation. I think it's retributive. And so it is the objectors to traditional atonement theories who say, we have no experience of the punishment of a third person for the sins of another, or we have no experience of a blameless third person being held liable for the wrongs of somebody else. And that's where you see we can appeal to our American or, or Western system of just say, oh, no, no, there are many analogies like this that are recognized by philosophers of law and legal theorists. So you cannot use that as an objection to the biblical view um, because the very intuitions that you're appealing to um, don't support it in, in uh, the theories of justice that we're familiar with. So it's just a way of defeating objections is all. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, final question. Uh, I think uh, I think this one is quite close to your heart and uh, and to mine as well as a former uh, philosophy student uh, in Sweden. Um, this person says, in Sweden, there is not a single theist at the philosophical faculties in the universities, and they do not teach theism at all. All philosophical faculties teach atheism completely unchallenged, unchall to be blunt. What can Christians do to change that? 
I'm sorry to hear that that's still the situation. I, I know that was the situation many years ago when I visited Sweden, and I'm sorry to hear mm. it's unchanged. It seems to me that Swedish students, if they can, would be well advised to study abroad. Uh, and I mean this seriously. This is what I did. I went to England to do my doctorate in philosophy. And I would encourage Swedish students to apply to universities in Great Britain, like the University of Birmingham, where you can freely pursue Christian philosophy or, or theistic philosophy and get your training there, and then go back to Sweden and try to make a difference. So I would encourage people to broaden their horizons, to think widely uh, about study abroad. I would also encourage uh, students to avail themselves of the many resources in English, uh, in Christian philosophy. Over the last generation, there has been a real renaissance of Christian philosophy in the Anglo-American realm. And we can really profit from that um, if we read and understand English well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in terms of having an influence, it's just going to be a very, very slow process of trying to teach at Christian institutions um, like Apologia, where you give this training outside the university and hope that eventually, someday, somebody will secure a professorship at a secular state university. There will probably be what I call intellectual martyrs along the way, people who are denied professorships or denied tenure. But if we keep at it and are persistent, eventually uh, we'll break through. And one opportunity is to actually study at your school, Dr. Craig. Um, As you did, how, Matt. <laughs> yes, which was an excellent, I mean, I, I was as close to heaven as I've ever been um, uh, at this far in life. It was extremely good uh, getting Christian philosophy or philo philosophy from a Christian perspective on, on all major um, areas of philosophy. So I would really recommend that if there's a possibility for, for someone of you who are, are listening. Um, check up Talbot School of Theology, Biola University. That's, that's the best I can recommend. Good. Excellent. Well, Bill, we will let you go. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to send us your lecture, as well as uh, respond to questions here from, from the audience. Uh, we hope uh, next time we welcome you to Sweden, it will be uh, in person and not uh, digitally only. Uh, but thank you so well, much for being Well, that would be a delight. Tonight. My yes, pleasure. I've really enjoyed our time together today.